I'm creating this video for my own closure and to log the conclusion of this scenario. Now, if you've been following this channel for the past couple days, I did a live stream the other day, I think it was on the 28th of August 2023, where a former student of mine who during this particular live stream used an account with the username colon man comma space Michael period and they asked a few questions and um, which I answered and it was very cordial uh, type of conversation and then I edited that live stream and republished it to the public because the original live live stream is available to channel members in its unedited form so if you want to see that you can support the channel become a member and go watch it along with a plethora of other members only material that's neither here nor there uh, when i premiered the edited version of the stream replay then this same individual began commenting in the chat of that premiere but using a different account, I think it was called Galileo or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the name of the account was, the username. But they began using correct sentence structure. And in the correct sentence structure, they used a couple things that seemed odd to me. The correct sentence structure itself was awesome. I mean, it was very cool. All the positional sequencing was correct. Um, however some of the facts th this is an example you see on your screen here they used the spelling a e x p e r i e n c e for experience and then i asked them right off the bat i said what is your specific etymological continuance of the evidence for your spelling of that word experience because right off the top of the my head i was looking at it and say like, okay ex is a particle of negation there's not much you can do to it to make it not a particle of negation historically speaking if you go through the etymological history of that particular specific precise word there is no wiggle room with that it's always a particle of negation historically speaking. So I was asking him, what is your solid, concrete, conclusive continuance of the evidence for your spelling of that word using the AE? Or is it just something you pulled out of thin air and you just decided to spell it that way with no certification, no continuance of the evidence for doing it. Sort of like the way Russell J. Gould spells the word family with an I at the end, or he'll spell the word only with an I at the end. Any word that he wants to use that has an L-Y at the end of it, he will turn the Y to I, as if that makes it okay. But there is, the point I'm making is there is no substantial, there's no concrete continuance of the evidence that family was ever spelled with an I, or only was ever spelled with an I, or experience was ever spelled A-E. And when I asked that question, the kuleana that this individual gave back was that it was the same mechanic that I had used. He, he was speaking to me. He's saying, it's the same mechanic you used to go from E-Q-U-A-L equal to A-E-Q-U-A-L equal. Where I use the A-E-Q-U-A-L. And then I in turn said, that is not correct. Because I've done videos where I show the continuance of the evidence that yes, historically speaking, if you look it up in an etymology dictionary, you parse the word, you will find in that continuance of the evidence, proof that equal once was spelled A-E-Q in some form. There is evidence of that. I can show it. I have shown it. The same thing that I did with the O-E in oite 
to correct the word use. U-S-E, because U-S-E, U is a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word. It's a particle of negation. So I was trying to find solutions to this because use is a pretty common word, or use, or usury. So I did my study, I did my legwork, and I found solid proof, continuing to the evidence, that somewhere in the etymological history of the word U-S-E, there was a form of it that was spelled O-E-T-I. And I showed that as well. That's the continuance of the evidence for why I spell or use the word oite, why I spell equal, A-E-Q-U-A-L. Now, I was asking him to do the same thing with experience. Show me your continuance of the evidence of that word specifically. Where in that word's history, experience, was any form of it ever spelled A-E-X? Now, this is sort of a rhetorical question because I knew he wouldn't be able to, to do it because it doesn't exist. Instead, what he did was go through a whole dissertation, paragraph after paragraph, talking about something that he called the ash, which I'm going to show you what that is in a minute here. And a lot of the stuff, if you're familiar with this channel, you've been studying for a few years or whatever, it's going to be very repetitive because I've already put this stuff out there, but I feel it's necessary for closure for myself for this particular scenario so I can log it and date it and be done with it because I have blocked all of the accounts from this individual that I know he uses simply because um, at this point, as I stated in a previous video, the purpose and function of this channel is for those that want to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. I teach it with over 800 videos on this channel. If you have grammar questions, you want to learn it, you're welcome here. But if you're coming here to push your own agenda or your ideas, this isn't the place for that. And I politely said that to him several times, and he just basically ignored it, didn't acknowledge it, didn't answer my question. I asked him, why are you here? Are you here to learn grammar or are you here to push an agenda? And he completely ignored it. So I jettisoned him in all connected accounts that I could find. Because uh, that's just basically pretty much being a jerk, ignoring the terms and conditions of the platform. Because he's more than well, I mean, if he has more than one YouTube account, he's more than welcome to go create his own videos on his own channel and teach his own version of whatever it is he's teaching. So now that that's out of the way, let's get to the hard evidence. So to begin with, uh, what he started claiming or trying to explain, putting the A-E in front of the X in the experience word that he used in his correct sentence structure fact he said it's an ash, and then I looked it up. As you can see here, it says ash symbol. It says A-E, the symbol in the International Phonetic Alphabet that represents the sound A-E, a lower case of the A-E ligature. Both the symbol and the sound are commonly referred to as ash. Now, anyone here who has a rudimentary closure on correct sentence structure knows that A-S-H is a particle of negation. It's a no contract word. It's a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word. Not only that, it's a vowel in front of two consonants. So why would you use such a thing? Is my question. So let's go to some more closure on this AE. Near open front unrounded vowel. It's near open front rounded vowel. In Danish. Anyways, so he was saying, basically, this is my perception of what he was saying, that he can take this ash, this no contract ash, and use it in pretty much any word that starts with an A or an E. He can replace that single vowel, A or E, like in the word answer, or experience, he can replace it with the no contract ash, and now suddenly it's positive performance. With no historical, etymological continuance of the evidence, he's just doing it because he wants to use the word. Which, don't get me wrong, 
it's okay to do that. If you're the authority of your own construct, you're welcome to do whatever you want. You can pull stuff out of thin air if you want to or out of your butt or however you want to do it and use it for your own communications, your own contracts. However, if you want to contract with other individuals, they in turn are going to have to come into joinder with what you're doing. And if they know what they're doing and they have closure on correct sentence structure, the two styles probably are not going to mix. Because those who have closure on correct sentence structure, the biggest thing is closure, continuance of the evidence. You don't just pull things out of the air. If you create things or create something new, now, as I said, you can do it yourself like he's doing it for your own contracts, but it always helps to have certification. Maybe you're teamed up with one or two or three or four other people and you decide this is the best course of action to take for the spelling of this word and the meaning of this word and you all agree to it, you certify it, you authorize it. Now it's become a fact between you. Now you have other people agreeing with you and you can use it. In lieu of hard etymological evidence of the spelling of that word, if that makes sense. You can do it that way too. But to bring it back to this guy, he's doing it just on his own, apparently, just choosing to, he wants to use the word answer. He knows there's a particle of negation with A at the beginning of the word in front of the consonant. So he's just going to modify it to A-E. He wants to use the word experience. He sees the particle of negation at the beginning of the word, the E, in front of the X, or even the X, E-X. He's just going to replace the E with A-E, with no etymological proof or evidence, and without anyone else to certify it. He's just doing it on his own authority. Again, friends and neighbors, which is fine if you want to do that in your own construct. If you're the authority of your construct, cool. But when it comes time to contract with other people and giving that closure, especially in a foreign vessel and dry dock or something like that, it's going to get a little bit more challenging, perhaps, than he thinks it will. If you do not have a solid continuance of the evidence or certification of other contract parties backing up and giving weight to your claims. When... At the beginning, a uh, few years ago, maybe in 2019-ish or so, um, my tutor, full colon Raven, hyphen Farhide, hyphen Tohidi, colon Aferen, and myself were thinking about solutions to problems such as in one of the most well-known sayings, rule one, rule equal. We wanted to use the word equal but it was a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of the word, particle of negation. So we began using rule one, rule kindness for a little bit while we were doing research. And I've seen also Russell J. Gould use rule one, rule same instead of equal because he knows that equal has a particle of negation at the beginning of it. But I, friends and neighbors, went a little bit deeper. And I looked it up and I found something called the digraph, which I give closure to in a few different videos. Here, to sum it up, in the fiction from Google, from the Oxford languages, it says, a digraph is a combination of two letters representing one sound. Okay? That is simple enough, is it not? So I have that basis springboard with which to begin looking for solutions to using the word equal, E-Q-U-A-L, and trying to find some way to present that as positive performance, as well as trying to find some equivalent of the word U-S-E or U-S-U-R-Y, usury or use, find some positive performance way to articulate those concepts. Because again, U in front of S at the beginning of words, a vowel in front of a consonant, it's no contract. So here is what I did. I went to etymologyonline.com and I typed in the word equal.
And I'm looking, I'm looking, and then I see this. From Latin, A-E-Q-U-A-L-I-S. Equalis. Bingo! There it is, right in front of your face. Hard evidence, a continuance of the evidence, certification, right here in an etymology dictionary, as I'm parsing the word, there is historical evidence that equal in one of its forms was once spelled A-E. And that's all I needed. It used the digraph. Digraph itself is positive performance, unlike ash. So there's that. So now what about usury? How can we make that positive performance? Use. Do, do, do. Oh, look at that. Again, old Latin. Oite. O-E-T-I. So my spelling and use of the word O-E-T-I is backed up by a hard, specific, continuance of the evidence that historically speaking use in one of its forms in history was once spelled o-e-t-i there's another proof of the way i do things i can certify it i've just certified two things to you two of my claims which i actually certified years ago but i'm doing it again here for the purpose of this particular scenario now let's look up colon man comma space michael's experience and see if we can find the same hard and fast continuance of the evidence that experience in one of its forms throughout history was spelled AEX at the beginning of the word. Experience, experientia, No, it comes from two particles, X and per. So X, let's look up the history of X. Word forming element, meaning out of, from, but also upwards completely from Proto-Indo-European out, e.g. HS. Now out is non-tangible contract, but there is no historical evidence that experience was ever spelled A-E. And so that, that is the point I'm making. Unlike use, which in one of its forms throughout history was spelled O-E-T-I, and equal, which in one of its forms throughout history was once spelled A-E-Q-U-U-S. So that is the difference. So when he told me that I asked him what was his evidence or certification or proof of that spelling of experience, and then he said, I used the same method that you used with equal, he's 100% incorrect. It is not the same method. I just showed it to you. Because there is historical evidence for the spelling of A-E-Q-U-A-L and O-E-T-I, but there is no historical evidence specifically, I just showed it to you, of experience ever having been spelled A-E. There is no continuance of the evidence. So, let's compare and contrast. Is there a historical par se continuance of the evidence for experience being spelled A-E-X-P-E-R-I-N-C-E? -E -E? The answer is no. Is there historical evidence that equal in one of its forms began with A-E-Q? Why, yes, there is. Is there historical evidence that the word U-S-E in one of its forms was spelled O E? T-I. Yes, there is. So there you go. Now, 
Here's a little tidbit to put in your back pocket, my gift to you. You don't have to use the digraph to spell these words. My salvages of A-E and O-E-T-I and so on and so forth are open source. You can also write them like this. It's not a problem. I don't mind if you use it, and it's for the ease of the communication. If you don't have the capacity on your keyboard to do the digraph, you can just do the AE. That's fine. I've allowed for that in my dictionary. Now, one more thing that I'm going to circle back around to. I did say you can create something new out of thin air but you must have certification of it. In other words, perhaps another contract party, just like three live life claimants can certify and authorize you to be a live life creature or a live life claimant. It's the same thing with facts. While in your own construct, it's okay for you to make stuff up, create stuff, and you authorize it because it's just you. But when you start articulating and coming into joinder with other contract parties, they must agree with what you're doing. They must certify what you're doing if they're going to contract with you. Otherwise, they're not going to contract with you. If you're just pulling stuff out of thin air and it doesn't make sense and there's no evidence and there's no weight behind it. So if you have to create a new concept in order to move forward, just like creating a live life claim, then you would need witnesses. You would need other uh, contract parties to come into joiner and certify what you're doing and that's exactly what I did with this word one I took the same principle the digraph from oite and I used it for the word one because a vowel in front of a consonant is no contract o n e so I spell it o e n or I use the digraph. And I worked on this and certified it with my tutor, colon Raven. And then I've also worked with other people who agree, hey, that's a great idea. That's the way we're going to do it from now on. So we can use the word one in a positive performance type of way because there is no etymological evidence for the OE in one. However, in this case, the weight behind it comes from the contract parties who agreed to use it that way, rather than the no contract O-N-E. So as I stated at the beginning about this guy, how he's spelling experience with A-E-X, that's fine and dandy if he wants to do that with himself in his own little world, in his own biosphere. But once you come off the porch and come out in, with other contract parties in other venues, you have to have certification. You have to have other people who agree with you that, hey, that's a cool thing to do. Let's do it that way. Blah, blah, blah. Your case is always going to be stronger if you have a concrete continuance of the evidence like I do with equal and oite. But then there's also the other method that you can use in a pinch, which is the one I used with the word one. So to round this one out, I'm going to give closure on some of the terms that I used in here. For the digraph of this finite mean is with the performance of the joinder with the two vowels of the character symbols or of the hieroglyphs with the writ of the word particles with the nativity function by the, this claim. And then backwards for this claim of the nativity function is with the word particles of the writ with the hieroglyphs, symbols, or with the characters of the two vowels with the joinder of the performance with the finite mean by the digraph, period. Next one, for the AE, the digraph AE and AE of this finite mean is with the claim of this symbol and digraph with the function of the cognitive certification with the divine current of the life force with the form of the consciousness with the sensation by this claim. Backwards, for this claim of the sensation is with the consciousness of a form with the life force of the divine current 
with the cognitive certification of the function with this symbol and digraph of the claim with the finite mean by the AE and AE, period. Then for the one of this finite mean is with the claim of this whole with the conveyance of this cognition with a form by this claim. For this claim of a form is with this cognition of the conveyance with this whole of the claim with the finite mean by the one. And then finally we have for the oite of this finite mean is with the grasp, hold, or with the possession of a tool, matter, or of a material with a single multiple or with a perpetual performance flow of the handler with this contract by this claim. And then backwards for this claim of this contract is with the handler of a single multiple or of a perpetual performance flow with a tool matter or with a material of the grasp, hold, or of the possession with this finite mean by the oite. And that is my closure on why the method that I use to certify and provide a continuance of evidence for my facts is obviously very different than this colon man comma space Michael period. And of course there is a reason why he is a former student and there is a reason why he has now been blocked from this channel. I do have a set certain way I do things. And that's the reason why Full Colon Raven and myself have remained such great friends and brothers over the years is because our paths and our volitions as far as this grammar goes are, are congruent with one another. As far as the mechanics of creating things and the way to certify things, it's very specific. It's very simple way to do things. And that's why the method that I teach, which was developed by him using the foundation that Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller provided, and in which I took even further to distill it down into simplicity, that's why it works. And that's why I do have successful students who are able to teach it themselves. Not former students, successful students. Because I still consider myself to be a student of Raven. I'm always learning. I do also consider my most successful students to do, uh, still be students of mine. You know, not, not in a possessive sort of way, but just in a way of always learning from each other, from one another. One another. <laughs> so there you have it. For the record, for the log, um, this situation, uh, this puts a nice bookend in it. I know that it's a, this is actually very high level stuff. And there are some things that I said in this video that there is probably no way, shape or form that a beginner would know what I'm conveying. But maybe, just maybe, if you decide to get closure on this grammar and you study it one day, you will be able to cognize it. And it may be the thing that clicks it in your head and then correct sentence structure becomes just like riding a bike. You never forget it. And that's a beautiful thing when that happens. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure communication, parse syntax grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like and I'll do the same and we'll see if this is something that you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. Thank you again and I'll see you in the next one.